Amen. You guys can take a seat. I want you to think about something kind of weird with me here this morning. I want you to think about your personal hygiene for a minute. Just like this morning you woke up, you probably did something to either your face or your teeth or your hair or your armpits, something like that. You, you might have uh, adjusted your hair or, or put on some makeup or something like that. Hopefully, if you're a girl and not a guy, um, hopefully you did that. Um, but I want you to think about your hygiene real quick and, and think about all those hygiene products that you use, your toothpaste, your gel, your deodorant, maybe cologne, some kind of makeup, something like that. Those, those seem pretty, seem pretty like everyday, everyday products, everyday mundane things, but has any, of, has, has any hygiene product, anything that you've used in your hair, your teeth or whatever, ha, has any of it ever changed your life? Think about that for a minute. Wow, that one, that one makeup cream, like that changed my life because of my dry skin or whatever it is. Like I'm just talking like I'm Karina right now because that's what she would say. And think about maybe that one gel that you use now every day, or that one deodorant that somehow, some way, like just masks your your bo that you have. Um, I don't know. Um, but for me, I had this one, uh, I had this one thing, this one personal hygiene. Uh, thing that I use every day that changed my life, and that was the toothpaste that I use. Sounds really dumb, sounds super stupid, but for me, a- as a kid growing up, I always, always got canker sores. You guys ever get canker sores like in your mouth, and it, they just hurt so bad, um, like those big, like gross red sores inside of your mouth. And so I used to get those like, like all the time when I was a kid. Like literally, I got those maybe once a week, once every two weeks. So like very often I had a canker sore in my mouth. And um, then I remember when in my sophomore year of, of, uh, of high school, I got my wisdom teeth out. And uh, this is no, no, nothing against like the doctor that I used uh, to, to get this out because he, he went to the church and uh, he, he, he did it for free and everything. But he went in to, to my teeth. And you know, with wisdom teeth, they just go in there, they numb you up, and then they just like yank these teeth out, like up, up in your gums, and they just yanked them out. So anyway, like, my teeth back there are so sensitive because of that surgery that I had to get those wisdom teeth out. And so this toothpaste that, that my, my dentist told me about, um, Sensodyne Pronamel, it's what I use every day. And it's one of those toothpastes that you have to pay, like, five bucks per tube on. But you know what? It's so worth it for me because it changed my life. Now I don't get canker sores once a week. I, and my, my teeth, like, all the way in the back of my mouth, they don't hurt every day. Every time I drink a cold water or something like that, they're not sensitive anymore. This toothpaste, I can say, changed my life. And when you hear me say toothpaste changed my life, you kind of roll your eyes and you're like, okay, that's kind of weird. Um, but if I say toothpaste changed my life, you would, you would assume that I, I, I use that toothpaste every day. And, and you're safe to assume that. I do use it. I used it this morning. Um, I used it last night. I used it yesterday morning. I use it every day. So when I say toothpaste changed my life, you, you would you would automatically assume that I, I use it every day. You don't assume that toothpaste changed my life one time back at sophomore year, and I've never brushed my teeth again. I've never used that toothpaste again, and it's still, my life is still changed. You would assume that I use it every single day. And you know the gospel, it's kind of the same way. We think of the gospel as that, that one thing that, that changes our life at the one point of conversion where, where you're justified by, by faith, and God saves you, and then and then, you know, you never use it again. It's just, it's just one of those things that you use once, you use it and lose it. You don't use it ever again. But the gospel, it's, it's kind of like that, that toothpaste that I was talking about. It ch- changes your life at one point in your life, radically transforms your life. But, but then you're, you're using it, if you will. You're, you're, you're applying it every day of your life, and it continually will change you, uh, change you every single day. And our, our text last week, we talked about the gospel changing the lives of the Colossians. It goes in by this guy named Epaphras. He preaches the gospel to these guys, and they get saved, and they bear fruit, and, and all these awesome things. Um, and so today in our text, uh, as we move along in our journey through Colossians, we're looking at verses uh, 9 uh, through 11 in chapter 1. We see Paul uh, not necessarily thanking God for the work um, that he, he's done in the Colossians for saving them, but instead now we see Paul praying that the gospel would continually shape their life and change their life. Not like using toothpaste one time and never using it again. You, you use it and it changes your life every day because you continually use it and apply it. So I want you, if you would, open up your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to look at just verses 9 through 11, just these three simple verses. 
Um, and we're going to see we're going to see how Paul is diligently praying for the Colossians for the gospel to to change their life day by day. So today, my challenge to you is is, is for you, and not 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 just for Paul, but for you to to diligently pray to 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 resolve yourself to pray every day for more and more change in your life, pr- praying that the gospel would, would would take even more effect in your life and transform you each and every. Day. So Colossians chapter 1, look at verses 9 through 11. This is part 2 of our gospel-centric series. we got one more um, next week, and then we'll move into a series about, about Christ, about Jesus. Um, so that's where we're going. But Colossians chapter 1, 9 through 11, read it with me here. Paul says, And so, from the day that we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. So so we see Paul diligently, persistently, praying for these Colossians. I, I love what it says right at the beginning there. If you look back at verse 9, he says, um, from, from the day that we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. He's not giving up in prayer. How often do you, do you pray and, and, and you pray for something for, for a day or two and you give up because you don't see anything happen or you maybe pray for a week for this one person to get saved or you pray, for whatever you pray for. You, I think all, all too often we will start praying for something and, and then we'll give up so easily. Well, Paul, Paul here, he says, this is so important to me that the, the gospel continues to take effect in the Colossians' lives. He's persistent and he's not giving up. He's persistent, but he's also specific in what, what he's asking for. He's asking that, that the gospel would, would take over their life day by day. And if, just a quick quick sidebar for a second here. Uh, if, we, if, we look at this, if we look at this text, we, we, we always want to talk about, you know, our, our ministry in this church. We're all about three things. We're about upward, inward, outward. And we see Paul, he's controlled by two of these things in our text here. His, his love for God, his upward love for God has prompted an upward prayer with God because of his love for others. So he's praying his upward relationship with God is affected by his inward relationships with one another. They're, they're all interconnected for Paul. And so he's praying right now for, for these Colossians to have a transformed mind so that their, their mind would be transformed for the glory of God. So I want you to uh, write that down for point number one. Pray for a gospel transformed mind. That's, that's the first step to, to living, for, li- living for God. Be, being a Christian, the, the first part of it is, is you getting a mind that is, is transformed. So he's not ceased to pray for you asking not necessarily so that they would do something right now, but the first thing he says is asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. He's talking about knowing stuff right now. He's talking about being filled with this knowledge. And when, when you see the word filled right here in this text, he's not necessarily talking about just thinking about this all the time or um, that just you'd be super smart and, you know, you'd go to seminary or something like that. You'd study your Bible every day. I, what he's talking about here is he's talking about being filled with the knowledge uh, of, of his will, the knowledge of the Bible. The, the idea is he, he's fully controlled by it. He's, he's filled with this knowledge that now affects his, his life. If you think about something right now with me, it's like, it's like filling your body with, with coffee. I don't know if you've ever like, like had way too much coffee before. I definitely have, especially when I was in junior high, like I didn't know the power of coffee, and so you go to Starbucks and you get those like big, tall, like frappuccino drinks, and you just drink and drink and drink, and then my my like hundred and maybe at that point hundred and fifteen pound frame in junior high or something like that. Like I was pretty skinny and small, um, still am, and um, so I, I just remember drinking all that coffee. It would just affect me, and I'd be there and I'd just be like, Ugh. like I can't, I can't control myself. Like I'm freak, like like the Noah dance. Like, <laughs> like that was me all. That was me all the time when I would drink coffee. Like I'm just, you, you drink so much of it, you're just, your body's affected by it. And you're just, you're controlled by it. You're not just filling yourself with it, and there's no like ramifications of it. You're filling yourself, and then you're controlled by the coffee. And that, that, w- that was me when I would drink too much coffee. And that's kind of the idea here is you're filling yourself, I mean, not with coffee here, but you're filling yourself with uh, knowledge of, of God, knowledge of, of the Bible. Now you're, you're controlled by it, just, just like you would be if you drink too much coffee. You're controlled by it. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, 
verse uh, 14 and 15. Write that down. You don't have to turn there with me. But I love this text. Pastor Elliot preached from it a couple weeks ago. But, but Paul says here, that the, the, for the love of Christ controls us because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who, who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The idea here is if you're a Christian, you're now controlled by the love of God. You're not just filled necessarily like, like our text says, but now you're, you're controlled by this. You, you feel so that you would, you would be controlled. And maybe you're sitting here today and, you know, we, uh, we, I know we've, we've spent all summer together and, you know, we talk in small groups and revival and all this stuff. And I know a lot of you are sitting here like, uh, you know, I just can't, I can't get over that, that one sin. Like, I, I, I just fall to it every day. I, I'm, 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 I'm always angry. I'm always complaining. I'm always uh, lusting. I'm always uh, stealing or whatever, whatever your, your problem is, that you, you feel like you're controlled by it. Like, you can't, you can't get over this sin. You're fighting. You're, uh, as we keep talking about, we talked about on Friday, where you're a slave to sin if, if you're not a Christian. You're controlled by it. Well, the, the solution is, is right here in, in our text and right here in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 is the way that you won't be controlled by sin anymore is if you're now controlled by Christ. You, you give up the control of your life. You give up trying to fight your sin on your own and you give up that control to Christ. You hand over the, the, the controls of your life. I remember a couple weeks ago I said, um, Jesus is no, he's not a co-pilot. He doesn't just get in the car with you and help you drive. Like, no, no, no. Jesus becomes the pilot of your life. He takes over your life. He controls it. For the love of Christ controls us. Being filled so that you might be controlled. And what are we, what are we filled with? He says, filled with the knowledge of his will. What are we talking about here? Well, uh, I would say we're talking about this biblical knowledge or this biblical, this wisdom that we have. That you can find in, in, in the Bible, knowing God's will for your life, knowing, knowing what the Bible says, knowing how to live your life, knowing discernment and wisdom and how to, how, how to fight temptation, how to, how to live this life in a, in a, in a hostile world for, for, for Christ. Well, where do we find that wisdom? Where do we find that biblical knowledge? Well, I think the obvious answer is we find it in the Bible, right? Where, how, how do we know the will of God? How do we know God's will for our life? Well, well, we open, we open up the Bible. If you flip over your, your worship, your worship packet for a minute, and you look at the top, that what's the first distinctive of Compass Bible Church? The Bible is central. It's not just, it's not just central in our name, because it's literally central in our name, if you ever get that. Compass Church Bible, right in the middle. That's pretty good, right? I know you like that. Bible, Bible is central, not just in the name, but it's a central it's the central mission of this, of this church. It's, it's central in everything that we do and everything that we preach and every event that we have. The Bible is central. That's where we, where we find this knowledge uh, of, of God's will. We're filled with this knowledge of his will. And that's why, that's why I keep pushing you guys all, all summer to do your daily Bible reading. You hear me say that like every week, don't you? I come up here and I'm like, guys, get posting, get reading. Get in your Bibles every single day. And the reason I say that is so that you can get this wisdom, so that you can get this discernment, so that you can get this valuable sword of the Spirit, this valuable thing in your life. And I know your Bible, it seems, it seems mundane. It seems like just another book. Like, what's so special about this? Well, it's kind of like uh, back, in, back in 2016, there was this, there was this family um, that was living in the South. They won't even say their name or where they're from or anything because they want to be discreet about it. But there's this family um, in, in America, in the South, and they were, they were just rummaging through uh, their great-grandfather's attic. Like he died and they're just going through his stuff. And so they're just, they're uncovering boxes and finding trash everywhere and all this stuff. And they find this brown paper bag. And they open this bag. It looks like trash. They're about to throw it away. And they open this bag and they find, they find seven baseball cards. And they're just they're like, oh, well, okay, whatever. And, and turns out these seven baseball cards are like the rarest baseball card like in the history of the world. Like there, before this, before 2016, there were 14 known baseball. It was this Ty Cobb. It, they were made in 1909. And, 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 two, and two of these cards that were, were in this stack, they were the nicest ones that the world has ever seen. Like they had to make a new category for like, like pricing baseball cards because they were so nice in mint condition. And so in this brown paper bag, they found seven. And you know how much money these seven baseball cards were worth? 
seven baseball cards, like little pieces of paper. $3 million they sold. But like these seven baseball cards for $3 million. In this family, they were about to throw it away, throw it in the trash. But you know what? They just pocketed $3 million in their pocket. They brought it to their local card shop and they were like, hey, what are these, you know? And, and they're like, wow, you've got something special. And then so they like had to fly out to, it was actually like Newport Beach where they had this like really fancy like card collector place. And they, they valued these things at $3 million. So this family, they almost threw away this brown paper bag that had $3 million stuck in it. I mean, can you imagine that for a minute? You're going through your grandpa's stuff and you find a bag with pretty much $3 million dollars. Like, that's like national treasure status. Like, that's like, that's incredible. And so that's what this family, that's what this family found. They didn't think it was anything special. They thought it was a brown paper bag, but the value inside of it, even though they didn't totally understand it, maybe you're here today, like, I don't totally understand the Bible. It, it just, it's kind of another book to me. It's, it's just one of those things. Well, I mean, the value that you have in your Bible is worth more than that brown paper bag of, of $3 million worth of baseball cards. It is so valuable what you have in you, in your phone, in, in, on, on your lap right now. And you, you see me uh, like pounding you with, do your DBR, do your DBR. And you see it's like, oh, it's Matt just forcing me to do it. He's forcing me to do it. Maybe if you've got good parents, they're forcing you to read your Bible. And you, you know, that's, that's, all, that's all good and fine. But you ought, to, you ought to come to the point where you don't see it as like a forcing, as a me forcing you or your parents forcing you. But you got to see what's in that brown paper bag, if you will. You've got $3 million worth of baseball cards. You've got something that's infinitely more, uh, of more value than $3 million worth of baseball cards right here. And, and as soon as you flip that switch in your own mind of, wow, look at the value and, and the amazing the gift and treasure that I have in the Word, then maybe you'll start to appreciate it and start to, start to read it more. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, it says, it, it's talking about the Bible. It says, for the Word of God, it's not just any other book, but it's, it's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Have you ever thought about your Bible like that before? This thing, it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Is it one of those things that you just, you wake up in the morning, and you're like, okay, well, cool, all right, goodbye. And, and just like toss it around like it's no big deal like it's a brown paper bag. Well, inside that brown paper bag, you've got the infinite riches, more than $3 million worth of baseball cards right here in your Bible. The value is incredible. So don't see it as a chore. See it as, if you will, a, a treasure hunt. You, you are looking in your Bible. You get, to, you get to read the very words of God. Think about that for a minute. God God, God has, has talked to you, maybe not in your sleep or in a dream or something like that, but he's talking to you right, right here, the words of God. It, are, are you just skipping it every morning? Oh, I'm too tired to, to read it. I'm too tired to hear from God this morning. Oh, you know what? I got too much homework. I can't, I can't read this. Oh man, I have to wake up at 6.30. You don't understand. It, it's so early. I can't read my Bible at that point. Oh, wow, like, I can't go post because, you know, it's, it's too much. I, I don't think I could do that. You know, it takes too much time. Well, guys, this is the, the living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and of spirit, joints and of marrow. That's what this is. It, it, it might look like a brown paper bag, but it, it, the infinite worth and value in this book is incredible. So, let that be an encouragement to you that you need to read your Bible this week. You need to be posting on DBR this week. And I, and I will offer a challenge to you right now. I will offer a challenge to anyone who will take this challenge. So right now, till next Sunday, if you add those out, that's seven days. Eight days if you include today. I want you to post on, on DBR five times. Five times. And if you do, I'll have something special for you next Sunday. Five times. Don't know what I'm talking about? CompassTustin.com slash DBR. CompassTustin.com slash DBR. If you post five times this week, reading your Bible and, and commenting on the text, even you could even just write, I've read it. And that's, that's good enough for me. If, if you can do that, that's awesome. If you can do more than that, that's even better. It, it, trying to apply what, what you're reading to your life if you can do that five times this week, I'll have something special for you next weekend. 
And it's so special that I don't even know what it is because I haven't decided what it is yet. But I'll decide this week. I've got a week to decide. And you've got a week to post five times, okay? Five. That's not even 100%. That's like, that's like 60%. Like if this was school, you just fail. Like that's how low my bar is right now. Like, I, like I, we're in a classroom right now, but I'm telling you, you can get a D. Like you can get a D in my class right now. Just five times out of eight, which I don't know. You can do the math on that. It might be a D or a C or something like that. Five times. Can you do that? Not hard. Five times. Okay? Five times. Eight days, five times. If you do that, I will, I, I will bring a undisclosed gift that is undisclosed to me as well. But I want you to get in your Bible. That's the, that, that's the point. You, there is so much value in your word. That's where you're going to find the knowledge of God's will. You ask that question, what is God's will? Well, open this up and, and you'll discern what God's will is for your life. You, you're, you're reading about, we're reading through the Gospel of Luke right now. And you know what we're going to hit here soon? We're going to hit the, the crucifixion of Christ. You think you can learn a couple things from that? Then what about the resurrection of Christ? You could probably learn a couple things from that. And then we open up after Luke. What's after that? John. John's got a lot of stuff in it that you can learn a lot from that. There's so much stuff that you can, that you can learn about God, make it a priority. Don't see it as a chore, but see it as, as something that you get to do, as a, as a treasure hunt. You get to open that seemingly brown paper bag and, and, and uncover the, the mysteries and the, and the worth and the value inside your Bible. So that's, the, that, that, that's one way. And we talked about this summer, if you were here for our Bible reading sermon, um, we had like, I think I had like five or six different ways for you to get the Bible into your life. And so that was one of them, just reading it. Super, super important. But the other thing that you can do to get the Bible in your life is simply just come here on a Sunday. What am I doing right now? I, I am, I'm preparing a, 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 a Bible study. It, that's all I'm doing here. I, I spend my whole week just preparing a Bible study to share with you. That, that's, that's it. Well, that's not it. I, I, I do more than that. Um, but that, that's, that's the point. If you come here, and, and, and maybe you come here every week, and, and, and this is just what your family does or what you do, but how do you treat it? The sermons, think about that for a minute. Are you more interested in talking, looking at your phone, falling asleep, making jokes? Or are you more serious about, okay, I want to know what God's will for my life is? Think about it like that. I go to church. I want to know God's will for my life. I'm spoon feeding you right now. Like I'm literally spoon feeding you Bible. Okay. All you have to do is open your mouth, say, ah, and I will spoon feed. I'll put it right there in your mouth. Swallow. That's all you have to do. AKA just sit here, listen, pay attention. Don't joke around. Don't talk. Don't look at your phone and just listen. Maybe take notes. Take notes. Do you guys take notes? I see a couple of you guys taking notes. Take notes. Why? Not because my, I'm so great, not because like my sermons are amazing, but take notes because we're opening the word of God and you want to learn what God has to say about your life. Being filled with the knowledge of his will. Where are you going to do that? You're going to do that by, by opening your Bible every day and by, by, by hearing Bible sermons. Those two ways you're going to get this, this knowledge of God's will. And so he says here, he says in verse 9, if you look back at it with me, he says, I, I'm, I'm asking him that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. And then he, 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 he emphasizes or he uh, describes what he's talking about. He says, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The idea here is there's practical wisdom and discernment for your life. That's what the Bible has to offer. It has practical, applicable nuggets of, 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 of wisdom and of, of discernment that it, it can it could put into your life if, if you let it. And that's why, that's why for this Bible reading thing, we, we put this posting site together. It's not just so that we can like keep track of how many times you posted. It's not so that you can go get a prize next Sunday if you posted five times. The idea of this is so that you can get in God's word and then so that you can reflect on it for a minute. Just, just stand there. What does this have to say to my life? How does this apply to my situation at home with my parents? You know, it's not good. I, I, what, is, what is Jesus telling me about my relationship with my parents or my relationship with my classmates or my relationship with my brothers or sisters or whatever it is? That's, that's why, we, that's why we, we post. 
for spiritual wisdom and understanding, for practical wisdom and discernment in your life. And Paul, Paul right here, he, he's praying that this would happen in the life of these Colossians. He's, he's praying. He's not just saying for them to do it. He's, he's praying, God, would you continue to do this in their life and, and build them up and to fill them with the knowledge of your will is what Paul is saying here. And so I, I would encourage you to start thinking about maybe your prayer life a little differently. Maybe you, you wake up, you pray, or you go to sleep and you pray. And, and you know, that's all, that's all good. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you do that. If you do do that, I hope you do that. Um, but what, what, are you, what are you praying for? You praying for, you know, I'm praying for school. I'm praying that I would get through that test. I'm praying that, you know, that my parents would make enough money this month or whatever, whatever you pray for. Think about your spiritual life for a minute when you pray. Think about praying that God would fill you with his knowledge, that he would transform your mind. That you actually pray for a gospel-transformed mind. Maybe you're sitting here struggling through sin and you, you can't get over that one sin like we were talking about earlier. Well, have you prayed, God, would you help me? Would you change my mind? My mind is, is polluted. It's full of junk. It's full of sinful thoughts. I sin every day just, just in the confines of my skull, just right here in my mind. I'm sinning all the time. God, would you help me? Would you transform my mind? W- would you change it? Would you, would you purify my mind? Maybe you're praying that. You're praying to, to know the knowledge of his will better. Maybe something that I'm trying to do more and more. Um, before I open my Bible every day, when, I, when I'm just doing my daily Bible reading, I'm trying to think through, I, I want to pray. I pray right now before I open God's Word. I want to pray that God would help me learn about Him. Would, I, I pray that He would help me learn about what I need to do in my own life, applying this text. Do you pray before you, before you read God's Bible? Maybe that's something that you need to do, praying that God would show you His will, show you how to apply this text whatever you're reading. Pray for that. Pray for a gospel-transformed mind. But the point of knowledge is not just to, to puff you up with knowledge, or not just so that you can just be smart, not just so that you can know your Bibles, um, but, but the point of knowledge is, is it results in this life change, and that's what Paul is talking about. Here he, go, he goes on to talk about it changes your life. I try to think sometimes in um, just my, my practical life, and even just when, I, when I'm writing sermons or something like that, I'm trying to think of three main things. I'm trying to think of what do I know, what do I feel, and what do I, what do, I do? Know, feel, do. If you think about those for a minute, uh, I, you, you, you know things. You, they, they should influence each other. You, you know who God is. You know what God's Word says. You know the knowledge of God's will for your life, and you start to, to feel maybe conviction that you're not you're not matching up to, to his will. Or maybe you're feeling encouragement to match up to his will. The no, you, your no has got to influence your feelings and your feelings have got to influence your, your doing. Let what you know influence what you feel, influence what you do. Let it actually alter your actions. Let a gospel transformed mind actually change your life. Change what you, what you do. And that's what Paul, he does right here. If you, if you look back at this text with me in verse 10, he continues this thought. He's, he's praying for, for them to be filled with this knowledge, but then he also prays for that knowledge so that, verse 10, so that as, as you walk, so as you, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. The idea here is is he's praying for a gospel transformed mind so that he can see a gospel transformed life in these people. So I want you to write that down for point number two. Point number two, pray for a gospel transformed life. These two are are deeply interconnected. You got got to start with this gospel transformed mind, but then you also need need to not just stop there. Pray pray that your mind would be transformed, but also pray that now your your life would would reflect that transformed mind. That knowledge would result in action. That's what Paul's trying to talk about here. He says, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Ask you that question. What is worthy of God? What, what is worthy of, of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, if you've been to church for more than five minutes, you know that, that God is holy. God is a perfect God. There, there's, no, there's no sin in God. There's no blemish in God. Well, what's worthy of God? Well, the obvious answer is perfection. Okay, are, are, are you perfect? Well, no, right? 
we've, we've got an issue here, but, but that, should be our, that should be our striving, our, our goal. Is we, we want to be as sinless as we can possibly be. Holiness, purity, walking in a manner worthy of God. You're sitting here, how, how can I do that? How can I walk in a manner worthy of God? How can I be fully pleasing to him, this text says? Well, the only way that you're going to do that is through the power of Christ. If, if you actually have been transformed by the gospel, you get this, this thing called the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, comes and he, and he indwells in you. He lives in you, within you. That, that is so cool. So is, if you think about it in that way, that Christ is, is, is in you. You know, Christ isn't the Spirit and the Spirit isn't Christ, but they're, they're, all, they're all connected. Christ now lives in you. I love Galatians 2.20. Write that down, Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The idea here is, 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 is Christ was crucified so that now you could be crucified to Christ so that now Christ would, would live through you. It would, it, it would influence what you do, what you, what you think, what, what you say, what you do. Christ wins your battles. He lives through you. It's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. He, like we said in 2 Corinthians 5, he takes control of your life. Have you let him take control of your life yet? The Lord of your life, the pilot, not the co-pilot, the pilot. If you do, he, he now lives in you. He lives through you. He wins your battles. It's kind of like um, you're driving up to LA or something like that. Remember these billboards were all over Louisville. Um, but those like injury lawyers, you guys see those guys, it's like, call this number because this guy, the hammer, he's going to fight for you. You know, he's going to win you millions of dollars or whatever um, if you're in an injury. Um, and the, the idea is you hire this guy, you pay him a ton of money, and, and he'll, you don't have to do anything. He goes in and he does all the work for you. He studies the law. He studies the case. He, he goes before the judge. You, I mean, you, I guess, have to come with him, but like he fights for you. You don't have to know the law. You don't have to get it, but he does. He knows it and he, and, and he fights for you. That's kind of the idea of Christ here is, is he lives, you don't hire him like you do a, 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 um, an injury lawyer, but, but he fights for you in your place. He, he lives through you. So trust in Christ to, to help you walk worthy. Stop trusting in yourself that, oh, I can, I, I can, just, I can just fight off sin. I can, I can just try harder. I can just do better. Well, that's not really what the gospel is. The gospel is, no, no, no. You, you give up, you surrender yourself to Christ, and he takes over your life. I love Second Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 10, 13. One of the best, most encouraging verses in all the Bible. It says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure under it. Or, or endure it. It is, it is God is going to provide an escape for you in temptation. Do you look for that escape? You're tempted to just... Do some, whatever it is. You're tempted to, to, to yell, to, 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 to complain, to, to, to get angry, to, to, uh, to gossip, whatever it is. Do you, do you submit those, those areas of your life to Christ? Do you, do you say, you know what? I, I, want, I, I want to look for that way of escape. Because if you do, the power of Christ is more powerful than you. If you submit to him, you, you can start to walk worthy of the Lord. Are you going to be perfect? No, you're not going to be perfect. But, but you can... You, you can be better. You can, you can walk in more holiness towards God. He gives us, right here, Paul, he gives us three ways that we can walk in a manner worthy of God, fully pleasing to him. The first thing he says here, if you want to write it down, the first thing he says is, is bearing fruit. That's one of, one of the ways that you, can, that you can seek continual growth. So you can pray for a transformed life. You can pray for, for a continual bearing of fruit, producing good character, good works, Think about uh, the fruit of the Spirit from uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Well, you guys know the fruit of the Spirit. I know you do. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Think about your life. Are you, are, are you doing those things? Are you growing in love? Are you growing in joy? Are you growing in peace, patience, kindness? What about self-control? How are you doing in that area? 
pray that God would help you grow in each one of these. All nine of them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. God, help me grow in these. Help me grow in my love towards, towards my mom, towards my brother, towards my sister, towards my classmates. God, help me be joyful in, in hard circumstances, patient when, when, when I'm tempted. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And if you remember back to last week, in verse 6, Paul says that he had seen fruit in the lives of these Colossians. And he was praising God. Thank you, God, for, for, for seeing the fruit or for, for producing the fruit in these Colossians. Well, now he's praying for fruit. Wait a minute. I thought he just said that there was fruit. Now he's praying for fruit. The idea is growth. The idea is, okay, there's fruit. Okay, God, God has saved you. Great. Well, we want to see more and more fruit. A- and you to be conformed more and more into the image of his son. More and more holy, more and more self-control, more and more loving, more and more joyful, patient, kind, and goodness, faithful. Pray that God would, would help you take your, your good works, your good character to the next level. You know what? I, I'm so glad that I've been, I've been, be, been able to, to love you know, my, my brother or sister better. God, thank you for be able, me being able to do that. God, but I pray that I would do it more. I'd be more sacrificial. I'd be more joyful. I'd be more patient, kind, goodness, faithful self-control. Think about that right now. Maybe write it down. God, I, I want to pray that I would do this better. I would grow in, the, in this fruit. Be specific. Pray that God would help you bear more fruit. That's the first thing he says. Verse 10. Walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to God, bearing fruit in every good work. And the next thing looks a little familiar, doesn't it? He says, what does it say? Increasing in the knowledge of God. Well, we just talked about that, I thought. I thought we just said, you know, he wanted them to be filled, have a gospel transformed mind. Well, when you're a Christian, you, you want an increasing of a knowledge of God. You want to, to know God better. You want to grow. When a real Christian is transformed, their, their heart is, is transformed by the, by the gospel. They're, they're transformed to now love him more. More and more and more. You know, it's like, you know, when you, you get married. Not when you get married, when one day you get married. You, you, okay, say you, you love that person on the day that you get married. Great. That's awesome. You should. At that point, you should, you should get to that point where you love them on your wedding day. But what did all these old people tell you? Well, I love them more today than I, than I ever did before. Like, that's always what your grandparents tell you, right? And your parents tell you that. And I'll tell you that. I mean, I've only been married for three months, but, you know, I love my wife more than I did when I got married. It's just, it's more and more. You seek more and more and more deeper relationship, more deeper love, deeper knowledge of, uh, of God. This includes your Bible reading that you'd be increasing, you'd be, you'd be by more and more, you'd be reading your Bible more and more, that you would love it more, asking God, God, help me love it more. Maybe you're in that boat right now. You know what? I don't love my Bible. I, I hate reading it in the morning. I don't want to wake up for it. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't want to read it. Well, if you're in that boat, maybe, maybe you need to start praying, hey, God, would you help me? God, give me a desire, a passion to, to read your word and to love it and to apply it to my life. God, help me love it more. Help me to desire it more. David says in Psalm 119, he says, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. I want to get to that point where I can say, Wow, it, it is the one thing that I love more than anything else. I love God's word. So I want you right now to, to make it a goal. This year, this week, this day, whatever, this, the rest of your life. I want you to make it a goal to know God more. I don't know what it is. Maybe you could be specific right now in your notes. How, how, what, should, what, do I, what do I need to do to love God more? How can I seek him better? Maybe it is, I just need to do my DBR and be more consistent with it. Maybe it's you picking up a book, you know, a, a good Christian book, and you start reading about God. Maybe it's, I want to listen to sermons more. I don't know, but make it a goal to know God more next year than you do right now. A year from now. When you're a year older and a year wiser, I, I pray that I, w- I would love God more. I would know him more increasing in the knowledge of God, continual growth. So that's the second thing. Bearing fruit, increasing the knowledge of God. What's the last thing he says? Look at verse 11. 
Last thing he says, so that you may be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. So the idea here is being strengthened with all power, being strengthened. A real Christian, they can seek for continual strengthening with God. We always talk about the cost of, of following Christ is great. You've got to take up your cross daily. You've got to die to yourself. You've got to crucify yourself to Christ. I mean, these are all bad images, you know, hard sacrifice. When, when you become a Christian, it is hard and it's sacrifice. So you, you're, you're now in a war. You're now in a war with, with, with Satan, if you will. And now you're fighting. And so, so you want to be praying for this, this strength, this endurance, this fighting. Flip on over to just a couple pages to the, to, the, to the left. Look over at Ephesians chapter 6 with me. You familiar with the armor of God? The armor of God, yeah, you've heard it before. You've seen it on Veggie Tales or whatever. I don't know what you do, but hopefully you're still not watching that. Um, maybe, maybe you are. I know some of you are. The armor of God. What is the armor of God? Well, the idea is being strengthened with all power to, to live for God, to fight against the schemes of the devil. Look at verse 10. Ephesians 6 chapter, no, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. We'll uh, read through verse 18 real quick. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Look, here's our opponent, verse 12. For we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the sp- all spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You, you see that? You're not just fighting against flesh and blood. You're not fighting against yourself. You're not fighting against other men. You are fighting against cosmic powers. Whoa. Like, this is a big deal. This is a big war. You're fighting against Satan, is what he's saying. You're fighting against cosmic powers, rulers, and authorities over the present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day And having done all er, to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastening on the belt of truth. This idea of you fastening on the truth of of God's word. You you, you have it on you. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. The belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of God that now is your protective shield that you, that you can't be, you can't be, um, you can't be tainted by the world. You, 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 You have the righteousness of Christ. The perfection of Christ is now on you. Verse 15, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. You've got shoes on that that, that is all about the gospel, sharing the gospel with people. In all circumstances, taking up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The idea is you you have this faith in God that's protecting you from from the schemes of the devil, from, from Satan's flaming darts. And taking up the helmet of salvation, the most important part of your body is your head. You, you've got the helmet of salvation. I'm, I'm, I'm saved. I know I'm, I'm right with God. And now the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the, the Bible, those are, those are, my, those are my weapons. The, the, that's my shield. And I'm now, verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. You'll be able to stand up against Satan. That's what, that's what you are. Right now, if you're a Christian, you could be a junior hire in California and you are fighting against Satan. Think about that for a minute. Like, that's a big deal. The, 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 the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers of this present darkness. But you, you have the power in, in, the, in the armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the, 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 the shoes of the, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the, the helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit you can use those to fight against Satan to be strengthened I love Romans 8 uh, verse 11 he says he's, he's saying basically that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you the idea here is the same power that rose that, that raised Jesus from the dead is now living inside you if you're a Christian. Like, think about that for a minute, just the implications of that. That same Jesus that you read about in here died, rose again, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that brought him out of the grave on the third day, Easter Sunday, that same power now lives inside of you if you're a Christian. 
Wow, that same power, that's amazing. I, I can fight against anything. I can fight against all cosmic powers and, 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 and over this present darkness and spiritual forces of evil because I've got, I've got Christ living. I've got the spirit in me. I've got power. Pray for this strength to endure temptation, to endure the invisible war that you have with, with Satan. Pray that you would remain in, in enduring and faithful to, to, to God. Praying for this continuing growth, bearing fruit, increasing the knowledge of God, and being strengthened with all power. Maybe your prayer list looks a little selfish. Maybe your prayer list looks like, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that, give me this. It's just a bunch of gimme, gimme, gimmies. Is your is your is your prayer life? Is your prayer list? Start to think about this. Maybe I I, I want to pray this this God centered prayer. I mean, yes, it's technically about yourself that that you would have a gospel transform and you'd have a gospel transform life. But the purpose of it is all for the glory of God. It's God centered. And did you know that that in the Bible, God assures you that He will answer that prayer. If you ever had a like like it's a money in the like it's like. It's a layup, you know. If you play basketball, it's just it's just a layup. You're wide open layup. That, that's all it is. It's easy. Anyone can do it in their sleep. That you have a for sure a, a assured answer of prayer. And you know what it is? It's it's if you pray. John 15 says, "If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you." By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Did you catch that? He's assured that if you ask anything in, in, in his will, he will give you whatever it is. For the, What's the Father's will? That, that, that he would be glorified and that you would bear much fruit. It's God's will that you bear fruit. It's God's will to answer your prayer if you pray for God's will. So what I'm telling you right now is if you pray these things, they will actually happen. Money in the bank. Automatic. Automatic. That's pretty cool. That's pretty, uh, you, you have now prayer. You have prayer that is automatic. If you pray, it'll happen. Maybe you won't see it like the second you open your eyes again. But you know what? If you, if you really prayed for a gospel transformed mind and a gospel transformed life every day, I guarantee you, you would see a gospel transformed mind and a gospel transformed life. It will happen. It's assured. God-centered, God-willed prayer. Last week we saw Paul worshiping God for, for the gospel working powerfully in the lives of the Colossians. Um, but this week we obviously see him praying that the gospel would continue to, to bear much fruit in their lives and continue to affect their, their life. So Paul, he's praying for, if you, if you want to just go over your notes again, Paul prays for them filling, be, being filled with the knowledge of his will, and then he prays for them to walk worthy. Bearing fruit, increasing in knowledge, and, and, and increasing in strength and endurance. I want your prayer life to look a lot more like that. God, I pray that you would fill my mind with the knowledge of your will. God, I pray that you would help me walk worthy, that you would help me bear fruit, increase in knowledge, increase in strength. And if you're not if you're not a Christian right now, you're sitting here, you don't care, or 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 maybe you do care and you just don't uh, you don't understand. You're you're just not. You're, you're not a real child of God. You don't really have the gospel. It hasn't really transformed your life. Well, this same gospel that can continually transform you every day, if you do, it, 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 the offer's on the table for you today. You can get the armor of God right now. Right now. You can get it right now, the armor of God. You can get real fruit. You can really get the knowledge of God's will if you repent. You place your faith in Christ. You give up your fight against sin, your fight, emphasis on the your. You're, you're trying, you're, you, you, you think maybe it, it's, it's more important to be cool at school or maybe you think it's more important to, to sin at home or whatever it is. You give, give that up. Let the gospel transform. You get the armor of God. You get strength. You get increasing in wisdom. You get fruit. You get a relationship with God. You don't want to get to the end of your life die, meet your maker, not have a relationship with God. Him look you in the eye and say, you know what, I, I, I never knew you. I know you went to church. I know you, you went to Compass Bible Church, but I never knew you. You don't want to get to that point.
You want God to look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. The only way that happens is if the, if the gospel transforms your life. And if it does, it, it will take over your life. It, the love of Christ will control you. So it's my prayer every day. I'm, I'm, I'm actually praying every day for you guys. By name. By name. I'm praying for you guys. The, the gospel, just like Paul. Paul's praying for the Colossians to have a gospel transformed mind and life. I'm praying that, that your mind and your life would be transformed by the gospel. So I hope this was helpful. I hope it was a good reminder for you to, 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 to push on in your, in your growing in your relationship with God, filling yourself with the knowledge of his will, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. But I pray that it would also transform your prayer life, that you would start to think about, not just think about, but pray about a gospel-transformed mind, and a gospel-transformed life. Gospel is powerful. It can change your life. It can change your life today if it never has before. Let's go to God in prayer right now and ask him to, to change us, to continually change us, just like Paul just prayed. Let's pray for that right now. God, we, we, we love you. We are so thankful for your word. God, that we are not left alone God, that you have given us the, the, the value and the treasure in your word of knowing your will. God, just like that, that brown paper bag that those people found with those seven baseball cards that were worth $3 million. God, we have found something infinitely more valuable than that. You have given it to us, God, and I, I, I'm so thankful. God, I pray that you would help us, especially the, the Christians here in this room, to be continually filled in the knowledge of your will, God, that that. That we, would, that we would have all spiritual wisdom and understanding. God, that we would, we would know you better, that we would love you better, that we would study our, our Bibles better, that we would understand it better. God, I pray that you would help us do that. Help us apply it to our life in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. God, but I also pray that now we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to you, God. I pray that, we w- that our lives would be those kinds of lives, that they would be fully pleasing to you. God, I pray that you would help us now bear fruit today. God, as we think through all all of the the good works that that we need to think through, the the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, as we think through all the the fruit of the Spirit, God, I pray that you would help us put that on today, that we would be changed, increasingly growing in those things, God. I pray that you would help us bear much fruit. God, I also pray that you would, you would help us increase in our knowledge of you. God, that we would know you better next year than we do right now. And God, lastly, I do pray, as Paul prayed, that we would be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. God, strengthen us. God, we know the war is here. We know the war is, ha- has come. We are, we are at war with, with the principalities and the spiritual forces of evil the cosmic powers. We're fighting against Satan right now, God. I pray that you would help us. If it was up to us, we would fail. I, I, I know we would, God, but I pray that you would help us fasten on that belt of truth and that breastplate of righteousness and, and, and the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the, the gospel or the shoes of the gospel of peace. God, and the sword of the spirit, I pray that you would help us put on that armor of God today that we'd be strengthened to do your will, to obey you. God, I pray that you would continually transform our minds and transform our life, God, that we would be more pleasing in your sight, our mind and our life. God, we love you. We're so thankful for all you're doing for, for us. Thank you for just the ministry that's going on in this, in this room every Sunday. God, I pray that you would continue to transform lives every week um, as we open up your word, open up the, the sword of the spirit that, that pierces to the vision of soul and of spirit, joints and of marrow discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God, I, I'm thankful for this word. Thankful for Colossians. God, I pray that you would use it to our effect and transform our life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.